The title of my message is The Resolute Remedy for Revival. You know, I, I ponder on some things. I, I ponder on some delectable dainties out of the kitchen of heaven. And as I think about what we need as a church, the first and foremost, more than anything else, more than we can talk about church truth and, and doctrine and uh, biblical mandates and, and what the Lord wants for us, more than anything else, it's just a nice and sweet fellowship with Him. I think that uh, I think that we've forgotten that somewhere down the line. We've forgotten the importance of just enjoying the fruits out of the kitchen of heaven. Just enjoying talking to the Lord like we had never talked to Him before. You remember when you first got saved and you just talked to God? And you just shared with Him your heart and He... And he, and he communed with you, and he sat with you, and he talked with you, and you talked back. Hosea chapter 6, I think more importantly than anything else I can talk to you about this morning, more than anything else, we, before we talk even about salvation, and salvation is absolutely need, needful, but further than salvation, what, what I want to talk to you about this morning is purging. You see, I, I believe within the right arm of God, that right arm takes his arm and wraps it around you. That, that arm, after salvation, that arm is an arm of purging. That arm is an arm that hurts. But the, the left arm, as he embraces you, that left arm, that left arm is the arm of hope and peace in heaven. Hosea chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Come, let us return unto the Lord, for He hath torn, and He will heal us. He hath smitten, and He will bind us up. After two days will He revive us. In the third day, He will raise us up, and we shall live in His sight. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this moment that you've given me. And Lord, I, I feel your spirit upon me. I beg that it would not be within, within my own power or just the volume of my voice, but the demonstration of you and your spirit. Lord, I beg that your spirit would come down, uh, come down with power. I'm, 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 in, I'm inadequate. I, I don't know what to say. I don't even know what to think. But Lord, that's, that's why I want you to come and take over. Please, Lord, take over and say something that I can't and uh, I need you. In your name I pray, amen. You know, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, it starts off with the same word. Come now, let us reason together. You know, throughout the Bible we see... And in, in my first point is day one, you see a common theme of what God wants for us. The first thing He wants for us as Christians is to come. As we see in this passage, God is trying to show His children the pathway to promotion must first begin with pain. Did you hear that? The pathway to promotion before God must first begin with pain. Charles Spurgeon said this, God's people can never by any possibility be punished for their sins. God has punished them already in the person of Christ, their substitute. But yet while the Christian cannot, con cannot be condemned, he can be chastised. Punishment is laid on a man in anger. God strikes him in wrath. But when he afflicts his child, chastisement is applied in love. The rod has been baptized in deep affection before it is laid on the believer's back. The Lord must first introduce us to purification before we can truly enjoy his presence. Hope that makes sense. The Lord must first introduce us to purification, to being holy, to being pure, before we can really enjoy his presence. You say, maybe that doesn't make too much sense to you. Well, maybe it should. 
The thing about this, if I were to give you a, a clean cup of water and, you know, it, it would it'd be, you know, just totally Britified, you know, it's nice and clean. The only problem is the cup's dirty. Brother Minor, would you drink that? No, why not? It's clean water, though. It's dirty. It's dirty. It's, it becomes disgusting. What about a, a woman that's getting ready to get married and she just got out of a mud pit? That's pretty ridiculous, right? You wouldn't want that. How about a delicious apple that just came off a tree and it's, it's gorgeous. The rain came down and just washed away. It's all clean and everything. But your hands were just in a dumpster. It doesn't, doesn't sit well with you. You know, it's interesting how we, we are so clear to realize that. But not too clear in understanding that how can the Spirit of God fill you when you're filled with unrepentant sins. I want you to listen to me very carefully. I believe that God allows things to happen to our life, whether it be through circumstance or God allowing a certain issue to come into your life. And He knows that you're not going to overcome it. But he allows it to come into your life anyway. Just like he did with the prodigal son. You see the prodigal son, there's examples of that all over the world. He allows that to happen. Why? Why does he allow that to happen? Why does he allow that baby that you had? And you love that baby. And, and you know, you serve God. You come to church every week and you just want to serve God. And you don't want to hold back from anything. But the baby died. Why? Why does God do that? Why, why does he do it? Why does he allow that to happen? In this passage, we see some words that I'd like to really discuss with you, talk with you about, and maybe hopefully it makes sense to you. The word tearing, it's, in Hebrew it's pronounced taraf, and it means to pull to pieces. And you say, man, that's, that's terrible. There's another word for the word tear, and it's, it's found actually in uh, Hosea 13.8. And it's, it's, the Hebrew word is baka, and that means to break. And then the word smitten is naka, and it means to strike lightly or severely. Now here's what's so important. In this passage, Hosea 16.8, the word... For tear is not to break. It's not baka. The word for tear is taraf. What God is saying is, before anything must take place, before you can get right with God, before anything miraculous happens in your life, before you, you should ever expect revival, expect tearing. Expect some things to happen in your life That'll be a game changer. Expect some things to happen in your life that are so crazy. God, and, and maybe they already have. Maybe you're at the point where, you know, these things have happened to me. And I don't know why they've happened to me. Or these things have happened to me and I know exactly why they happened to me. But God is, you, are you, he is using those things. He is using those things. Just like he did with Job. Just like he did with the prodigal son. You see, God is not going to break us. In Hosea 13, 8, it's, it's referring to a lion breaking. But in this reference, he's saying that he's going to tear us apart. And, and some of us are like, well, I still don't understand. I don't understand why he's tearing us apart. I don't understand that. Why would a loving God do such a thing? As I think about this example, and it's, it's hard for me to really think about it and ponder it, I'd like, you to, I'd like you to think about somebody that, that might really help you out with this thought, and that's the prodigal son. You know, as we think about the prodigal son, what do we think about? We think about a, a young kid that just wanted to do it his way, and he had his father. His father was there, but, you know, he wanted his own money. He wanted his own rule, his own morality, his own standards, his own accomplishments, his own fun. 
But at the end of the journey, what, what did he have? He had, he had his own mire and, and some pigs. You know, he was starving. He couldn't eat. And you know, I, as I think about this prodigal son, and I even think about Hosea chapter 6, what I think about, more than the prodigal son, I think about the father. Can you imagine the father? I, I'm not a father. I'm not a dad. I, I have a dad. I, I, don't, I don't know how disappointed or how sad he was. You know, we, we come to the conclusion that we're, we think the dad is so angry with his son. I don't know if he was angry with him. I just, th I just think he was hurting for him. I think he missed his son. I think every day he was waiting for his son to show up and his son didn't show up. And every day he looked from afar off and, and that son came down, but his son wasn't in it. I think every day he would pray and ask God for his son to come home and, then, and it didn't happen. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. I want to I want to tell you that, that as you read this, you should see that the prodigal son was torn and he was smitten, just like uh, Hosea chapter 6 is talking about. Luke chapter 15, verse 18, uh, verse, uh, 18. Luke chapter 15, verse 18. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. You see, it's not hard to think this way. Why is it not hard to think that you're, I mean, look at the prodigal here. The prodigal here himself just had this feeling that, man, my dad is going to, he is not, he doesn't even, I've done so wrong before him. He wouldn't even consider me his son anymore. I've done so wrong for him. I will beg him just to work, just to work under him so that at least I can eat okay. I, 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 I have done my dad so wrong. How can he ever forgive me? How can he ever get to the point and say, I, it's okay. I love you. He can't do that. My dad can't do that. So all I'm going to do is beg and ask him to just accept me as a worker. And that's, that's, that's it. Nothing more, nothing less. Just a worker under him. You know, and some of us here are exactly the same way. You have committed some kind of sin. Or you have went through some kind of problem. And you said, I'm too far from God. Nope. I think I'll just stay home. Nope. I think I'm just good here on the pew, and that's just as much as I'm going to do for God. Nope, I'm, I'm satisfied with status quo. Nope, thank you, but no thank you. How can God really forgive me after I did this? I'm content right here, and if I go any further, God wouldn't want me to go any further. You know, God chose me, He loved me from before the foundation of the world, but what I did here, I don't know. I don't think my, my relationship with him will ever be okay again. And can I tell you, you couldn't be any further from the truth. Amen. You couldn't be any further from what God is saying right here. You know, as this father is waiting day and night for his son to come home, I like to tell you this morning that God, if you're wayward, if you're backwards, if you're backsliding, God is waiting for you to come home. God is waiting for you to just give in, give up, stop with what you're doing. You constantly fall into sin, you dig yourself in the same rut, bring yourself to the same discouragement, aren't you sick of it? You know, it's interesting how, how that first word really means more than anything else. Come. Come. We see come. Come. The four-letter word, come. Keep on coming. Come. 
Why won't you come? Does that sound like a word of anger? Brother Tom, if I was angry at you, would I tell you to come or would I try to stay away from you? I'd more than likely try to stay away from you. Yeah, I don't really want to deal with him today. I think I'll go this way. Um, usually that's how it is during the week. But, okay, that's a bad joke. I, you don't have to laugh. It's okay. Uh, um, but that four-letter word is a word of endearment and, endear, and, a, and a word of love to come. You think, you think God doesn't know what you've done? You think God doesn't know what you've seen or what you haven't seen? Or what you have done or what you haven't done? God knows it all. And what he wants you to do more than anything else as a Christian, the, the most important thing you can do is come. And what, what do you do after? Confess. Just give it up. Give up that sin. There's nothing worth what you have. What, what, are, you, what are you trading it for? You, are, you, are you trading that pornography for a great relationship with God? Oh, yes, I said pornography. That's right. Are you trading that sin that you love? Maybe that adultery or that issue that you might have? I don't know anybody's life here. But I know what can keep you from serving God with everything that you are. And those sins aren't worth it. Do you want a good relationship with God? Get your heart right and have a good relationship with God. You don't want to have a good relationship with God. Stay in what you're doing. But don't tell me you can do both. You are not going to do both. You can't hug your sin in the left hand and hug God in the right hand. you got to let go of one or the other. you got to embrace one or the other. You either choose God or you choose your lifestyle. Die to yourself. That's what God's theme is. Die to yourself. Die to yourself. And do you think he's just some kind of dictator that is pleased with telling you that? He's doing it for your own good. He's doing it because he absolutely loves you. He's doing it because he wants what's best for you. What, why don't you want what's best for you? Aren't, are you content with mediocrity in your Christianity? Are you really content with, with who you are for the Lord? I, 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 personally, I'm not. I'm standing before you, and I, feel, I, feel, I absolutely feel lower than you. I don't feel like I, I, I am what I should be for God. Let's look at Luke chapter 15 again. I want you to see something. Luke chapter 15, and we'll keep on going. Verse 17 and when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have had bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will rise and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was a great way off, his father saw him and disdained him. He put his head down. And as his son came, he attempted to kiss him, but his father would not. And his son asked him, Father, may I be your, your worker? He said, No, you may not. Please depart. You are no longer my son, and I no longer love you. Is that what it says? I just, am I reading from a different version? A different version, right? Okay. That's not what it says. But here's what it does say. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was a great way off. And I want you to think about this. As I'm reading this, think about your relationship with God and put yourself in the prodigal's position. As, he was a, as you were a great way off, his fa your father saw you and had great compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to the father, You said, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no more worthy to be called your son. <laughs> his father shook his head and said, said it to his servants, Bring forth the best robe. Put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring him hither to the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. 
For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. That's pretty exciting. It's pretty exciting that a God that you thought was angry at you, a God that you thought was disappointed with you and didn't want to have anything to do with you, he wanted to stay as far, as, far away as he could from you. That's not at all what God wants for you. God wants you to come. Isn't it time for you to come or do you want to stay where you are? There are two clear uh, uh, positions that you can take. Day two, a pure people. This is one of those sure marks of a children of God. They kiss the rod. And the more the Lord chastens them, the more they cling to him. You know, the earlier I, I was talking about how God strikes us. He either strikes us severely or he strikes us lightly. And he tears us apart. And you wonder, what, why, would he, why would he do such a thing? But you know, it doesn't stop there. In, in Hosea, it doesn't stop there. He talks about more than, more than that. What does he say? He says in Hosea chapter 6 that, Come, let us return to the Lord. He hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. You know, the Hebrew word for heal is pronounced rafa, and it means to mend, to make whole, to repair thoroughly through stitching. Hmm. The Hebrew word for bind is kabash, and it means to wrap firmly. So right here, we're, we're, we're taking a a kind of a panoramic view of really what's going on. What's going on? What's going on is your sin. It's my sin. What's going on is God is the great physician and he's taking his scalpel and he's cutting us apart. He's tearing us apart and he's seeing these tumors that are cancerous and he's pulling these tumors out. And these tumors, inside of these tumors, it's filled with sin. And he's taking these tumors out. And he's throwing them away. He's taking these tumors out. And he's throwing them away. And you know, he doesn't stop there. Because after he, he meticulously and very carefully takes out these tumors without injuring us in the meanwhile, he takes these tumors out. He takes the needle and the thread and he stitches us up. He stitches us up so well. And he doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there because after you don't want any infection to happen. You don't want anything to get in, into that wound that you have. So what does he do? He takes some wrap and he wraps it around with his arm. He wraps it around. And you know, you might have scars after what you've gone through. You might never forget what you've gone through. You might have some issues of what you've gone through. But let me tell you, you know, even though your feet hurt. God's healing them. Even though your heart may, may have felt ripped out, He's given you a better one. Even though you thought you lost your mind, He's changing it. God is doing a work inside of His children. And before we can ever expect revival, before we can ever expect change to happen out at Southside Baptist Church or even in your personal life, if you, if you don't repent of your sins, if you don't stop with your sins, I don't, care, I don't care if you're a deacon, I don't care if you're a pastor, I don't care if you're a janitor, I, I, I'm, I'm a youth pastor and a janitor, but it, it, no matter where you are, no matter what position you are, no matter if, if this is the first time you've been to church in a long time or you've been here, since the day you were born. It doesn't much matter. God wants a good relationship with you. And if you don't come, if you don't get rid of your sin, you're never going to have a good relationship with the Lord. It, it's just that simple. 
Uh, we make it so difficult. We want to do this. We want to do that. We want to make sure that we have a tie on and, a, you know, our, our, home, our, our hair combed to the one side. But that's what's more important than that is to have a pure relationship with the Lord and for him to have that relationship back. You know, you, you wonder, why is he doing such a thing? Why is he tearing me apart? There's three reasons that I have. Number one, because he loves you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And at the end of that verse, it says, For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? What kind of son are you if you're not going to get whipped by God? Number two, because he wants you to grow stronger. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, Now no chastening for the present time seemeth to be joyous. But grievous, nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to them which are exercised thereby. Uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 20, 29, the last one is to be conformed to the image of God. For whom the Lord did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of God, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And my last and shortest point, as you are probably very thankful for, is day three. A prize for his people. You know, I was studying the, the process of how gold is made. You know, you know, did you know gold th goes through about five stages before it's actually ready? You know that? Here's, here's some of the stages. Number one, they, they, they have a stage. It's a bla they blast the rock. They have this machine that blasts the rock. And the next stage, it crushes the rock and it reduces it to the, about the size of gravel. The third stage is a mill. You take it to a mill and, it, and they make the, that gravel rock about the size of sand, beach sand. The fourth rock is they use water and they use uh, pressure uh, to, in a solution to get that clear. And then the last stage they, they have another mill and it takes it down and it separates it to actual gold between that rock and that debris and gold. And you say, man, that, those are a lot of stages and I don't even know why this is even important. It, it's very important. And the reason it is is because this is exactly what God's doing with you. You see, you, don't, you may not see a lot of value in you. But what God's doing is He's taking this big boulder that you are and He's going through stages. That stage may be 20 years, that stage may be 5 years, I don't know. But he's taking you through stages. And he's taking you and he's weeding all the bad stuff out. All the stuff that doesn't really matter, he weeds it out. Yeah. He takes it out. And he keeps on grinding you down. And you're getting frustrated with him. You say, God, why are you doing this? Why are you allowing this to happen? Why are you letting this to happen? But he keeps on doing it. And he keeps on grinding you down. And you keep on clinging to him because you love him and he loves you. But you keep, on, you, you, keep, you keep on wondering, why is he doing this? Why is he allowing this to happen in my life? Why does this happen? Why, why do I have to even get involved in this sin? If God knows so much, why is he allowing me to, to do this and disappoint him every day? But he keeps on allowing that, that process to keep on going. And you know what? You, you're, you're becoming smaller and smaller. But you know the, the best part of it, of it is, Sister Malcolm? You're becoming more and more valuable. And at the end of the process, when you stand before God, you may be this big, but you're gold. And that's what God wants. I'd rather have a, this little size of gold than a big boulder of nothing. And God wants you to be small in His sight. But during that process, He's making you precious and pure. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much.